Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of 2005's Fantastic Four. Ahead of the homecoming of Marvel's first family into the MCU in 2025, we are going back to look at the legacy of Fantastic Four film adaptations. We covered Roger Corman's low-budget 1994 Fantastic Four in another format years ago, but for many of us, the 2005 film starring three Steve Rogers, Chris Evans, Yoan Griffith, Jessica Alba, and Michael Chiklis, directed by Tim Story, was really our first introduction to this team. And, well, let's just say there are a lot of lessons to learn. And those lessons are what we will break down in this video as we go through this movie scene by scene to point out some really interesting Easter eggs that point to really what was an earlier draft of the Marvel Cinematic Universe from executive producer Kevin Feige. I think we can really see this movie as Marvel Phase Negative One. So over the opening titles, the flipping pages of the Marvel comics feature some stills from Fantastic Four comics issues. There's the cover of the Fantastic Four number 524, the cover of Fantastic Four volume 2 number 5, the cover of the Human Torch volume 3 number 11, the cover of of Ultimate Fantastic Four Volume 1, number 17. There's a panel from Fantastic Four, number 30, a panel from Fantastic Four, number 518, a panel from Ultimate Fantastic Four, number 9, and there's also this shot of Dark Phoenix in there, since the X-Men films were also under the 20th Century Fox banner at this point in time. And then following this movie, the next movie on Fox's Marvel lineup would be X-Men The Last Stand, featuring the Dark Phoenix storyline. But you'll notice the Marvel logo itself is not red, it is blue, the Fantastic Four's signature color. And then the camera travels along inside the four, which has these circles and symbols covering it. Now, this movie was made by 20th Century Fox in a partnership with Marvel Entertainment, where Kevin Feige was a rising star executive working with people like Avi Arad to partner with other studios to get Marvel movies made. So while we can see this 2005 Fantastic Four movie as a Fox-era Marvel movie, ugh, in reality, it's as much as part of Kevin Feige's vision as Iron Man and Thor were. He was just working with different creative teams, had less creative control, and hadn't really learned some critical lessons yet. Now, some history here back when Roger Corman produced the first Fantastic Four film in 1994, Baron Eichner's film rights for the property were set to expire, so to prevent that from happening, he and Roger Corman made that film for two million bucks, and it was never released, but it eventually leaked online, and our friend Tommy did break it down for us back in 2020. And then when Fox planned to do a new version of the Fantastic Four properly with a bigger budget, they approached directors in the late 90s like Chris Columbus, who earlier in the decade had done Home Alone, but then left from this project to go produce the first Harry Potter films. They also produced Peyton Reed, who also left, and eventually they approach Tim Story. Peyton Reed, of course, would later go on to direct the Ant-Man films for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But he always said that there was a version of the Fantastic Four film that he wanted to do that would be similar to A Hard Day's Night, a story set in the 60s, which seems to be the version of the film that Marvel Studios is doing, at least set in an alternate universe. But this film opens in front of Von Doom Industries on a worker welding together a statue of Victor Von Doom, which has these rivets on it, just like his metal suit did in the comics. Ben Grimm, played by Michael Chiklis, and Reed Richards, played by Yoan Griffith, have come to beg Victor Von Doom for funding to explore an impending cosmic storm. This is despite the fact that Grimm describes Von Doom as fast food strip mall science, setting up right away that Reed is the real scientist who doesn't take any money and Von Doom is the rich hack. 2005 was the era when tech companies like Apple were super mythologized by the press and Apple cultists who debated whether Steve Jobs was a true tech genius worthy of his riches and his reputation, or if he was just taking credit for the work of the true geniuses who worked for the company like Steve Wozniak. And I forced Steve Jobs into this because Jobs' position on the board of Pixar and the deal that Bob Iger struck with Steve Jobs in Disney's acquisition of Pixar the year this movie came out in 2005 directly led to the deal that Kevin Feige and his boss Ike Perlmutter signed with Bob Iger to buy Marvel to put Marvel under Disney a few years after this. I also bring up Pixar because this movie came out right after Pixar's The Incredibles in which director Brad Bird heavily drew upon Marvel's Fantastic Four for a retro futurist 60s setting and the power sets and personalities in vulnerability and strength invisibility, rash speed, and elasticity, and hips. The similarities were so clear that Fox had to change much of what they had planned for this Fantastic Four movie, and I've always been curious to see what that would have been. Now, Victor Von Doom's statue seems to be holding a molecule in one hand, and I kind of wonder if this statue might commemorate some nuclear discovery that he made back in Latveria. So Victor Von Doom, played by Nip Tuck's Julian McMahon, is introduced in the dark shadows with a giant riveted metal V behind him. This dude ain't very subtle. He's also surrounded by more harsh metal riveted art because they really want to foreshadow his eventual appearance. And what he says here foreshadows Reed's eventual turn into the stretchy Mr. Fantastic. Same old Reed, always stretching, reaching for the stars. Later, he foreshadows Ben's eventual turn into the super strong thing. So I see you're still doing all the heavy lifting. Reed explains that exposure to a high-energy cosmic storm might be what triggered the evolution of life on Earth. But Victor's only interested in delivering some sick burns to his old MIT classmate. But dreams don't pay the bills, do they? 
The headline on this Wired magazine reads, Reed Richards bankrupt announces grant cutbacks. There's also another story headline at the top that reads, Misspent Youth, the rise of the cut and paste culture. Wired magazine apparently has had several articles over the years about the rise of cut and paste culture. In the comics, Reed Richards is considered the smartest man on earth. And there's a long standing debate over whether he was smarter than Tony Stark. And that was actually settled in Iron Man number 16 when Stark was able to make everyone as equally as smart as he is, which results in Reed becoming dumber. For his presentation, Reed uses what at the time was a cutting edge smartphone, a Samsung SPH i700 on Verizon. Verizon was actually a marketing partner for this film, and there are product placements throughout this movie. We meet Sue Storm, Doom's director of genetic research, played by Jessica Alba, with blonde hair and some very unsettling blue contact lenses. When Peyton Reed was attached to direct, Renee Zellweger was considered for the role. When Chris Columbus was attached, he wanted Meg Ryan to play Sue and Dennis Quaid to play Reed. So I have to wonder, would that have made Jack Quaid Franklin Richards? But once Tim Story took over this picture, they went with Jessica Alba, who is coming off of Dark Angel and at a very high point in her career. Now, due to his work developing this movie, Chris Columbus stayed on as executive producer, and he really wanted this film to be pure comedy, kind of in the vein of the campy 1960s Batman TV show. Tim Story, who had proven himself with the success of Barbershop and Barbershop 2, talked him out of that approach, pointing to Spider-Man as a movie that was able to have a mix of serious storylines, but still a lot of comedy. And truly, this film follows a lot of the same story beats as Spider-Man, with Victor Von Doom as almost exactly the same kind of corporate villain as Willem Dafoe is Norman Osborn. Well, you kind of expect Victor Von Doom at some point in this movie to say, Out, oh, damn I! Back to formula! Sue gives Ben a big hug, but shakes Reed's hand icily because these two used to date, and the movie wants us to know immediately that they have baggage. She now apparently dates Victor in addition to working for him, something I believe is made up for the film since in the comics they were never romantically linked. Victor gets more digs in on Reed, telling him that he'll make enough money off his plan that maybe he'll pay off the fourth mortgage on the Baxter building. Our first mention of the Baxter building that we see later in this movie, the Manhattan building that becomes the headquarters of the Fantastic Four, kind of like their Avengers Tower. And like Avengers Tower, it was destroyed a few times, and we've been theorizing on and off of when it could be popping up in the MCU proper. And many of us have speculated that when Avengers Tower was sold, it's basically going to become the new Baxter building. Victor has this painting in his office titled, Officier des Chasseurs à Cheval de la Garde Imperiale Chajon. I probably butchered that, but it's giving off the same vibes as David's famous Napoleon crossing the Alps. There's another painting in the office that's the equestrian portrait of Charles Charles V, which is a tribute to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V after his bloody defeating of the Protestant armies. Clearly, Victor sees himself as a conquering hero himself, which stands in direct contrast to Reed, who says this about their upcoming mission. Ben, think about all the people we can help if this works. Victor's assistant, Leonard Kirk, is played by the amazing Hamish Linklater from Midnight Mass in FX Marvel superhero series Legion. As they talk, these decorative metal masks are on full display on the bookshelf, more doom foreshadowing. The elevator also has silver metal with rivets, and honestly, you just gotta admire Victor's commitment to decor. Sue hands Reed her Von Doom business card and says she'll be scheduling the launch because in this universe, people can just go into space without training for it for years. Clearly, this movie was made in a decade where they just didn't care about NASA anymore, which is kind of a bummer. Sue says she'll let Ben ride shotgun on the mission, but her brother, Johnny, will be the pilot. In the comics, Ben was a test pilot in World War II who became an astronaut for NASA. Johnny is introduced on a motorcycle, smooching a woman in a nearby convertible, while Steve Rogers would also drive a motorcycle just six years after this in the MCU's Captain America the First Avenger, Chris Evans was cast in this film because in the odds, he was kind of a hunky dirtbag. Not another teen movie, the perfect score, and while much about the character as written is pretty cringy from this film, at least by today's standards, there's no denying that Chris Evans is having a lot more fun playing Johnny Storm in this movie than he did in the first few times playing Steve Rogers in the MCU. Ben watches, telling Reed that he can't take orders from the underwear model. Ben and Johnny have a kind of big brother, little brother dynamic, which we'll see later with Johnny constantly playing pranks on Ben and antagonizing him. Ben explains that Johnny washed out of NASA for snake two Victoria's Secret models into a flight simulator and bagging hot chicks seems to be the one main defining characteristic of Johnny in this film. But, you know, let's not forget, just three years after this, in 2008's Iron Man, Tony Stark spends the first 10 minutes of that film insulting a Vanity Fair reporter into sleeping with him, followed by the future Goop founder calling her trash. Hey, it was the 2000s. In Ben's notebook, he has a photo of himself with his fiance Debbie McIlvain, played by The Walking Dead's Lori Holden. She also worked with Michael Chiklis on The Shield in 2008. There were also names of three people who worked on this film, Andrea Brown, extras casting, Stuart Bradley, special effects, and Stuart Bethune, production manager. Johnny tricks Ben by shouting, Captain on the bridge, and then taking a photo of him standing at attention. He says, Digital camera, $254. Memory stick, $59. The look on your hard-ass former CEO's face when he finds out he's your junior officer. Priceless. 
Yes. Yeah, he's playing off those MasterCard commercials from the late 90s that always ended with, there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Ben says, I don't know whether I should be flying or doing Swan Lake in these suits. I mean, who the hell came up with these? Yes, continuing in the meta tradition of films based on comic books, poking fun at the uniforms. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? Sue explains that Victor developed the suits and they adapt to the body's individual needs, setting up the way they'll adapt to each of their power sets later on. Reed sees Sue in the skin-tight uniform that's not buttoned up all the way and says, wow, fantastic. But it's just because he's excited about the material, and Sue is just very disappointed that he wasn't talking about her cleavage. And yes, she does have a full face of makeup on, false eyelashes and all, for this mission in space. All of a sudden, they're in space. No launch scene, no nothing, just saving movie money by showing them already in space. Sue tells Reed that they're a long way from the Hayden Planetarium. Hayden Planetarium is the planetarium in the Rose Center for Earth and Space inside the American Museum of Natural History in New York that Neil deGrasse Tyson is the director of. While discussing Reed and Sue's relationship, Johnny calls Ben Dr. Phil, referring to the bald and southern TV therapist prone to folks and quips like, no matter how flat you make a pancake, it's still got two sides, as well as, well, that dog don't hunt. Victor proposes to Sue with the most hideous ring in the most self-centered and worst way possible. This isn't every man dreams so meet a woman he can give the world to. In my case, it's not just a metaphor. At first, it sounds like he's going to compliment her by saying every man dreams of meeting a special woman like her, but instead, he makes it about himself. He's the guy that has enough money to buy anything for a woman, but really, who that woman is doesn't matter. So Sue sidesteps the proposal. The cosmic cloud accelerates and all hell breaks loose while Ben is still outside working. The voice of the computer is actually Lynn Ann Zager. Event threshold in T minus nine minutes. She was actually the voice of the computer in 2009 Star Trek. Here, where am I? Location Delta Vega, class and planet, unsafe. And the voice of the countdown computer in the lost episode Lockdown. System failure. System failure. Yeah, she's always warding people of their imminent doom. Victor closes the shields on the other four, including the woman he just proposed to, and they all get blasted by cosmic radiation. As each one is hit, you can actually see hints of what they will turn into later. Ben, seen through the helmet glass, looks like he has some cracks running over his skin. Reed, with his arms outstretched, proportions distorted. Johnny is hit with a fiery orange light that looks like he has flames spreading out behind him. Sue disappears and then reappears in a flash. And we don't see what happens to Victor, but later on, it turns out that since the radiation hit him through the protective shields, his skin begins to harden into a metal the same as the metal of the shields. In the comics, he did not get his powers in the same accident as the other four. Now, it's not totally clear how they all get back to Earth after this, especially since at least two of them were unconscious and didn't wake up until they were back on Earth, but suddenly they're all in a hospital. We get a fake-out moment when Ben wakes up in the hospital and Johnny pranks him by pretending he's already a hideous monster. Give me that mirror. I don't know if that's a good idea. They said the shock alone. Said, give me that goddamn mirror. Okay, Ben, just be strong. Yes, it's playing off the moment in Tim Burton's 1989 Batman. Mirror! <laughs> Which has been parodied many times, like in The Simpsons when Lisa gets braces. The mirror! <laughs> now, the changes are not immediate, but the first sign something is up is that the hair on Reed's temples goes gray. So in the comics, Reed gains the power of elasticity. He can stretch his body and mold it into any shape, and he can also absorb most physical attacks. Sue gains the ability to bend light waves to make herself and objects invisible and can produce invisible force shields. Johnny can absorb control and produce fire and can fly by enveloping himself in fiery plasma and propelling himself through the air. And Ben has rock-like skin and is super strong and is basically invulnerable. He's also immortal. Reed checks in on Sue, whose hospital room is filled with flowers because Victor is the king of overkill. I'm surprised he didn't send her flowers made of metal and decorated with rivets. Victor isn't there for her, though, because he's talking to reporters, and Reed tells the nurse what Sue's favorite flower is, something that evil Victor would never know. Turns out it's sunflowers. And just like Sue bending light, sunflowers always face the sun and interact with light. Well, I guess through phototropism, all plants do. But, you know, I, you get it. I guess it's kind of connected. Victor's got bigger things on his mind, though, because the bank threatens to pull funding from his company if he doesn't get his stock prices up in one week. Apparently, the stock market doesn't like it when a company takes some of the smartest people to space and lets them get blasted by cosmic radiation. And when the billionaire head of the company insists on being part of the space crew himself. But hey, I guess that's not too different from today's billionaires. Johnny feels cooped up in the hospital and goes snowboarding with Maria Menounos. You know, the one who's always before Nicole Kidman in AMCs. These are some real hardballs, Maria Menounos. And in this movie, she's credited simply as sexy nurse. Okay. 
She takes his temperature before they leave and it tops out at 209 degrees, but it's 2005 and we're on the slopes listening to some 41 and Johnny accidentally catches fire. He burns all of his clothes off and then he and sexy nurse take a dip together in this makeshift hot tub he created in the snow. And the music is some 41's newts, which includes the line, I feel the burning inside a feeling that no one should know. We get it. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Being healthy means more than just eating well and going to the gym. It means being mentally healthy too. Just like you might need a trainer to help you with your gym routine, you might need a therapist to help you with your mental health, and BetterHelp can help you find one that is right for you. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. First, use our link to go to their site, betterhelp.com slash newrockstars. The site will ask you to answer a few questions so BetterHelp can match you to an experienced professional who specializes in whatever you're struggling with. You can do it all from your phone or computer via phone call, video chat, or messaging, however you feel most comfortable. It's the easiest possible way to start talking to a therapist. You'll be matched to a therapist, usually within 48 hours so you can get started fast. We've been promoting BetterHelp for a while and we've heard some amazing feedback from you guys. We got permission to share this review from one of our viewers who said, quote, I used to be against the idea of therapy and didn't need it. After one session with my therapist, I completely pivoted and realized how beneficial therapy truly is. Let BetterHelp connect you to a therapist who can support you, all from the comfort of your own home. Visit betterhelp.com slash new rock stars or choose new rock stars during sign up and enjoy a special discount on your first month. The others also start showing signs of powers and Victor moves silverware slightly without touching it. Sue turns invisible for a second. Reed stretches his arm out to catch a falling wine bottle. Their powers progress pretty quickly. Ben turns into a bunch of rocks and then Kool-Aid mans through the hospital wall. It's clear that Tim Story's primary prerogative was a worthy effects picture that wouldn't feel anything like the 1994 Roger Corman B movie. And to be fair, many of the effects do hold up. Ben breaks into a men's big and tall store to steal some pants and a trench coat and a hat. And then he calls his fiance Debbie from a payphone, just like Homer Simpson in King Size Homer, he has trouble dialing. The fingers you have used to dial are too fat. As the thing, Ben has only four fingers per hand and four toes per foot, just like in the comics. So it's not super conducive to activities that require fine motor skills. The street where Debbie lives is Yancey Street. Ben Grimm first appeared in Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four number one in 1961. Jack Kirby actually modeled the character after himself. Kirby, like Grimm, was Jewish and grew up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Kirby was from Delancey Street and Grimm was from the fictional Yancey Street. Kirby's brother died when he was young and Grimm's older brother, Daniel, was killed in a Yancey Street gang fight. Throughout the comics, the Yancey Street gang would often terrorize Ben by playing pranks on him, like pelting him with cabbage and other rotting garbage and food. And in a recent Jimmy Kimmel interview, Eben Moss Bacharach, who will be playing Ben Grimm in the 2025 Fantastic Four, confirmed that this backstory detail would remain. Ben Grimm from Yancey Street. That's right, he's from Yancey Street. In the yeah. Lower East Side. Yeah. A yeah. sort of phonically similar to Delancey, but a sort of an imaginary street. Debbie comes down the street in just her silk slip and an untied robe, and even though she knows this has been since he just called her, still she screams and runs away. She's even willing to run into traffic to get away from him, which is completely insane. We get our first good look at Ben post-change. Of the actors, Chickless was the only one who knew the comics well and was already a fan. He fought to have a practical version of the thing with a suit instead of CGI. The costume was 60 pounds of latex and it took him three hours to get into, and he gotta admire his commitment. It looks pretty good in this movie. Ben sits on the Brooklyn Bridge to think things over. Oh, yeah, Ben. A few days in space. It'll be great. What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, definitely giving Bruce Willis and Die Hard vibes there. Come out to the coast. We'll get together. Have a few laughs. A pigeon lands on him, mistaking him for a statue, and does what all pigeons do to statues. This bridge shot was actually done in a Vancouver parking lot on a 200-foot set against a blue screen. The view of Manhattan was all CGI added in later. A jumper wearing a wedding ring and clutching a briefcase steps up next to him. This is actually Jason Shambing, who played Ronnie in the Comish with Chicklets. Ben saves this guy, but a bunch of cars crash into each other, causing a pileup. Sue, Reed, and Johnny, who just happened to be going over the bridge at the same time in a taxi, hop out, but they can't get through the crowd, so Sue has to strip down and go invisible to make her way to Ben. Although the others are also able to just get through the crowd right after this without stripping down. I'm not really sure how much sense that made, but this scene was apparently added to the script after Jessica Alba read it and had already signed on. And yeah, that kind of sucks. Still can't believe you made me do that. Ben saves a trucker. Johnny saves a little girl from burning to death. And they all save a truck full of firefighters. So now they're heroes. Like in the 2002 Spider-Man film, this film was in a post 9-11 New York. So if the fire 
a fight as to go with you, so goes the rest of the city. But as the crowd applauds, Debbie gets to the bridge and shakes her head at Ben in disgust. Like she just came here just to say, fuck you. And she leaves her engagement ring on the pavement. How did Debbie make it through the crowd if Sue had to get naked and be invisible to bust through? Who knows? The press labels them the Fantastic Four. And as they are making their TV premiere, Victor finds out that Larry King canceled on him. In 2005, this would have been when he was hosting Larry King Live. So you know Victor's pissed that he's the one member of the Beatles left out of the publicity love tour. The bankers notify Victor that they're officially pulling out. And we get this dolly zoom on him, so we just know he's losing it. But rather than the typical dolly zoom where the character plunges deeper and deeper into their world, it's the reverse of it where we push deeper and deeper into Victor's ego. Outside the Baxter building, a crowd of fans gathers with signs that read, NYU loves you. You're the big thing. Johnny's hot. And I love F4. There are a few shots at the top of the building, which in the comics was always kind of sciencey looking. Ben arrives with a heavy armored police paddy wagon, which is probably the only vehicle big enough to hold him without popping all the tires. Stan Lee cameos as Willie Lumpkin, the mailman from the comics, who actually looks like Stan Lee. This is the first time Lee has had a cameo as an actual pre-existing comics character and a character he himself wrote. He delivers a bunch of past due bills since we know Reed is broke and has four mortgages. The gang piles into the elevator, but just like the Hulk, things gotta take the stairs. I'll take the stairs. Take the stairs. Yes. Take the stairs. Take the stairs. Later, Victor even punches the elevator, just like the Hulk punches an elevator. In Reed's memories book that Sue looks through, there's an article with a young Reed with the headline, Local Boy Takes the Top Science Award, above another that reads, Vote Split East-West. Then there's one with the headline, Teen Wins International Science Prize. This article says, Richards, the son of a Los Angeles physicist, and that would be referring to Nathaniel Richards. Nathaniel will also be the name of Reed's descendant in the 31st century who becomes Kang the Conqueror. The article also says that Reed was born in Central City, California. An article with the headline, Hate Crime Rate Increases, mentions Dr. Dr. Elizabeth Walker, someone who actually helps with assisted suicides. And on top of the dresser, there's a framed and signed photo of the band Devo. As Reed runs tests on the others, his computer screen has information on Ben, full name, Benjamin Jacob Grimm, same as in the comics, occupation, professional adventurer, former test pilot, adventurer and wrestler, identity, publicly known, legal status, citizen of the United States with no criminal record. It also says he has increased reflexes, which we'll see later on when he kicks during the reflex test. When he's examined, his internal organs have a rocky look to them, and they are apparently completely solid as well. In the comics, they were much more dense and durable than average. Also, when he's in this thing form, he does not age. Ben says, How bad is it? You know, I used to smoke. In the comics, Ben smokes cigars until the run in the 90s when Joe Quesada banned all characters from being shown smoking. The same applied to Wolverine, who was also seen smoking cigars, even though he got to do it in the live action films, much to the chagrin of anti-smoking advocacy groups. During Sue's exam, the computer biography reads, real name, Sue Storm. In the comics, she has no canonical middle name. Occupation, professional. Yes, despite the fact that she was clearly identified earlier as Doom's director of genetic research, here, she only merits the label of professional. Identity, publicly known, other aliens, this is none, place of birth, New York City, marital status, single, group affiliation, Fantastic Four, formerly United Class Wrestling. In the comics, a bunch of characters wrestled in the UCW, including The Thing and The Eternals. We've seen these kinds of underground fighting rings before in Shang-Chi and in Deadpool and in X-Men Apocalypse. Johnny gets his temperature to 3,725 degrees Kelvin, which Sue says is approaching supernova, which would be around 6,250 Fahrenheit. Parts of the sun can actually reach 5,772 Kelvin. And there's this really cool detail when Sue goes invisible as they test her abilities where you can still see her ponytail holder on the back of her head because she can't make her clothes invisible yet. She gets some revenge on Reed here for his earlier emotional comments when she blasts him with an invisible shield. Victor gets his own checkup, which reveals that his body and all of his organs are changing into an organic metal alloy that's harder than diamond. This is because he was hit with the cosmic rays through those protective metal shields. In the comics, he simply builds himself a metal suit and he doesn't actually physically change. Victor watches the others on cameras that he installed at some point inside the Baxter building. This is maybe how he knew so many details about Reed and his dealings with NASA and his financial problems. On the board, Reed writes the acid dissociation constant, Ka, which measures the strength of an acid in a solution. Here, he's measuring it for nitrous acid, HNO2, and he realizes that their uniforms were exposed to the same cosmic rays as they were, so they're capable of changing to suit their powers. Ben wants once again, criticizes the look. You guys look like an 80s rock band. And then he jokes, maybe it's missing a utility belt. Now, a deleted scene would have shown Sue looking at all the junk that Reed kept, including what looks like a toy Herbie, the robot originally from the 1978 animated series that was thereafter introduced in the comics as part of the team. You know, you really need a janitor. 
And based on Marvel Studios' February 14th announcement art, Herbie will be joining the Fantastic Four in the 2025 film. Herbie even shows up in the opening title imagery of every episode of X-Men 97, along with Ben Grimm and with Silver Surfer. At the newsstand, Sue sees magazine with herself and the other Fantastic Four on the cover. And there's a People magazine with the headline, Sue Storm, who is she working for now? And underneath that, the text, has she jumped ship from Von Doom Industries? Did she and Dr. Reed Richards rekindle their romance? There's also another headline, and this is crazy, James Marsden eyes next superhero role under a photo of the actor, and then Another that says the mystique of Rebecca Romaine, which is interesting because obviously both this film and the X-Men films at the time were both done by 20th Century Fox, but they chose to have the X-Men exist in this universe, at least based off of this prop, as fictional characters rather than real life individuals. And specifically, this movie came out while X-Men The Last Stand was in production, and that movie would feature James Marsden's character being killed off and Rebecca Romaine's character being depowered. But a deleted scene later on would have shown Reed stretching his face to look like Wolverine. Well, I guess that's what I thought you always wanted. A stronger man. Now, in the finished version, Reed just squares his jaw to look more chiseled. This Fantastic Four movie is set in Earth 121698. The X-Men films took place in Earth 10005. But back in 2005, Kevin Feige and Marvel Entertainment partnering with Fox for both these movies, you can't see Feige at least experimenting to try to link these worlds together with cameos like this. So the Fantastic Four are dominating the news cycle because there actually are three People magazine issues with them on the cover. There's also a Scientific American with Reed on the cover, a Razor magazine with a thing, a Wired magazine from earlier with Victor, and two issues of complex with Sue and Reed. Victor's issue of Business Week has been pushed all the way to the back. It's actually possible to buy this prop at auction. There's also one real Maxim magazine mixed with all the other fake magazines. We get to see this family bond. Johnny pranks Ben with shaving cream. Between this shaving cream and the whipped cream and banana butt and not another teen movie, 2000s era Chris Evans just loved his aerosol cream. But the only one not having fun is Victor. A New York Post headline reads, Doom for Von Doom, Bank plans hostile takeover. And the Business Week issue from earlier reads, Space disaster crashes Von Doom Industries. Experts forecast bankruptcy in the final countdown for Von Doom Industries, its profits burn in space, and the Empire's numbers plummet. As he discovers more of his powers, the mask he'll eventually don sits in a glass case next to a sink. Victor confronts banker Ned, whose car is marinated in a puddle of water. In the trailer, Victor actually electrocuted this guy, hence the water. But here, in the final version of the scene, he blows a hole through his chest. But before that, Ned tells Victor that he could always move back to Latveria. And notice the actor pauses before the word Latveria to really make sure that we hear it. You could always move back to... Latveria. In the comics, of course, Latveria was the fictional nation where Victor was originally from, which he ruled over as Supreme Lord Dr. Doom. Johnny watches the X Games featuring canny cowboy Bartram, a real motocross racer who plays himself in this movie and was also a stunt performer in the movie Logan. Johnny goes rogue and takes off in his sports car with a personalized license plate of Torch. I have no idea when he would have had time to get that made. But at the X Games, Lloyd Banks on fire plays. There are a ton of corporate ads in these scenes, including a banner for Family Guy, which was canceled by Fox in 2002 before being brought back in 2005. So with this, Fox was clearly just trying to push it onto viewers. Johnny reveals his uniform on the news and there's now a silver four on the chest. He also comes up with the superhero monikers. He's a human torch, Sue's the invisible girl, Reed is Mr. Fantastic, and Ben is the thing. But the fact that these names start off as like disses from Johnny for the rest of the family, similar to the mockery of the blue suits, it was just kind of a thing in the 2000s to mock superhero aspects of being superheroes in movies. Compare this to Pixar's Fantastic Four, in which Brad Bird clearly understood how to embrace retro futuristic 60s style and superhero family dynamics into something campy, but cool and fun to watch. Johnny and Ben fight. Johnny calls him Pebbles from the Flintstones and Ben calls him Tinkerbell. The billboard Johnny is thrown into is for Burger King Burgers, fire grilled perfection, and it lights on fire, really wanting to sell some mouth-watering burgers. Victor raids the Von Doom weaponry, killing the guards. Ben goes to his local bar to drown his sorrows and meets Carrie Washington playing Alicia, who is blind. She does the thing that 2000s era movies love to do with blind characters, and she feels his a deleted scene would have shown Ben going to Alicia's art gallery after she creates a clay sculpture of him and puts it in the window. She also uses a painter's brush to dust him off, which is not a euphemism. Those are your puppets too? Those are my stepdads. That puppet line would have been a reference to Philip Masters, AKA the Puppet Master, a villain who could control people using radioactive clay puppets and frequently went up against the Fantastic Four. Victor's metal mask has a plaque that reads, in recognition for your humanitarian contributions from the people of Latveria. He plots to take out the Fantastic Four one by one, starting with Ben. Victor keeps his right hand gloved when he sits down at the diner. And if you listen closely, it makes a metal clank when he wraps his fingers on the table. He convinces Ben that Reed is just more interested in flirting with Sue than with curing him, which leads to the fight between Ben and Reed. Johnny shows Ben a thing action figure. Hey, look what the marketing guys did. Look, check it out. Listen, listen. We love this. It's clobbering time! This was a real toy from the 2002 line of Toy Biz Marvel action figures. And as Ben smashes it against the wall, it hilariously lets out a little scream. <laughs> 
Victor manages to cure Ben, and he's back to looking like Michael Chiklis. But he's promptly knocked out as Victor reveals his true villainy and somewhat metal face. And then Victor knocks Jimmy the doorman through the door. Why? What did he do? Ben decides to rethink himself as Victor freezes Reed and tries to take out Johnny and Sue with a heat-seeking missile. During the final battle, everyone gets to say their catchphrase. Flame on! Call me Doom. It's clobbering time. And this is where the movie really comes together. Everyone on the team works together to defeat Doom. Reed uses his elastic body as a slingshot. Sue is able to contain the fire within a force field. And Reed reverses the cruel science experiment line that Victor used on him earlier, saying what happens to metal when it's rapidly cooled. And it kind of feels like the way the T-1000 is initially defeated in James Cameron's Terminator 2. And by turning him into a statue, the movie in a way comes full circle as he looks a lot like his original metal statue that was in the opening shot of the film. Now, some point later, Ben and Alicia are dating and he's cool with staying the thing. Reed proposes to Sue and she says yes, despite the fact that they can't have been dating at this point for more than a couple weeks, since they are at a party for thanking them for saving the city, which would have just happened. Johnny makes a flaming number four in the night sky by the Statue of Liberty, which has to violate some sort of law. But you know what? It looks really cool. Now, we get one final scene at the end of the film, a sort of pre credit stinger. Victor is sealed into a shipping container among dozens of others, Ark of the Covenant style. The guy with the tablet is a cameo from Ralph Winter, who's the film's producer. As the camera pulls out, we see that the container is on a ship bound for Latveria. There's some Russian writing on the back of the ship that translates to the head of the toe. Not sure what they were going for there, but Leonard is told that the trip will take about 12 days and the worker's tablet glitches out because Victor is totally not dead. So next week, I'm going to be breaking down 2007's Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, but I want to end this video breaking down some lessons that Kevin Feige and director Matt Shackman might be keeping in mind when they look back at this movie and working on the rebirth of the Fantastic Four in the MCU in 2025. Lesson number one, we need to see the Fantastic Four in their time, not necessarily just ours. Like, Obviously, the Fantastic Four are going to be removed from time, and at some point, they're going to join a contemporary setting in the MCU. But really, what made them so great is that they were just Beatles-style celebrities in the 1960s. Second lesson, I think we need to lean into the bright, campy, retro-futurist look and not apologize for it. That's just something that the 2000s-era movies did, is it just assumed people were going to pay to see Marvel movies to make fun of what made Marvel special, when Kevin Feige learned in the MCU that the opposite was true. Lesson number three, NASA. We need to love NASA again. We need to reach for the stars, and we need to dream. And that's what the 1961 Fantastic Four lineup was all about. They were astronauts during the space race when Americans looked at the stars and at the moon and dreamt of one day going up there. And we need the 2025 Fantastic Four movie to embrace what made NASA so cool in the 1960s. And based off of the concept art, it seems like they are doing just that. Our next lesson, the movie really needs to embrace the themes of outsiderism versus fame. Fame isn't just something that happens to the Fantastic Four because Johnny Storm wants to be a daredevil motocross rider. It happens because Reed Richards feels bad about Ben Grimm having to walk around like that. He wants all four of them to be larger than life superheroes to turn his freak status into a celebrity status so that Ben Grimm won't feel as bad. And on that end, the next lesson is we really need to embrace Latveria and Yancey Street as roots for these characters. The 2005 Fantastic Four movie just treats them as Easter egg references, but they really are core to the DNA of Victor Von Doom and Ben Grimm. And last lesson, we need this next Fantastic Four movie to show what it means to be Marvel's first family. We need to see Reed's status as a true leader of the Marvel world. Because really the Marvel Universe as we know it from the comics began with the Fantastic Four in 1961. They are linked with every Marvel character, so we need to have characters who can just be friends with everybody. So I'll end with a question. Do you think we should add Pixar's The Incredibles to this Fantastic Four rewatch list? Because as we went through this video, I kind of talked myself into thinking that it is essentially a Fantastic Four movie, just with the characters in red suits instead of blue ones, and that movie is probably as influential to Kevin Feige and Matt Shackman as these other films are. So let me know in the comments below if you want us to add that. I want to thank Gina Ippolito for her help writing this script. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EAVoss. Follow New Rockstars and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.